Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, way back when, way in the long, long ago, we did an episode. It was episode two, which... Oh, well, well, in the before times. Yes. Uh, episode two, which we now usually want to refer to as episode one. <laughs> but uh, uh, but in ep- episode two, very famously, was the Well, That's Not Right episode. You probably remember this. I vaguely remember it being a thing that went horribly awry. Uh, it was it was six years ago, so I don't blame you for not remembering it in detail, neither do I. But on that episode, I, I basically presented you with five misconceptions that an outsider like me would have about tabletop gaming. Oh, boy. Yeah, and it went um, about as well as you can imagine. I think most of our um, meme things that we did kind of originated <laughs> from that episode. Uh, a lot of them did, including Total Pebble Lockdown, actually. But uh, on, on this episode... You were thinking about doing something a little bit like that, but in in a very different way. Turning yeah, turn I tables. wanted to turn these. I wanted to turn tables on you. Turn tables. That's a reference to the office, right? Tur- yeah, we. Tu- we're, I'm cultured. We're, we're we're doing cones of Dunshire. <laughs> no. Huh. Yeah, I wanted to. It's been uh, six years. Yeah. Wow. We we've done Ugh. probably a good three hundred episodes at least. We're not counting some of the live streams and uh, special episodes you didn't number, so... Uh, yeah, no, if we actually counted those, we'd be well over 300. It's a lot. So, there, there's been a bunch of episodes. You've played in a couple, several RPGs. You've run at least one RPG. Exactly one. Yeah. <laughs> We've interviewed dozens of people. Oh, yeah. I don't actually know the tally. I don't want to know the tally. It will scare Because then I have to go back and count. Yes. So, after, like... 300 episodes on the show, I was kind of just wondering, what have you learned? Nothing. Nathan? I've learned nothing. nothing. All right, episode over, bye! <laughs> episode over. This was a very short episode, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, um, but no, uh, you came into this as a newbie to tabletop games and role-playing on that scale. Right. Uh, you're, you've always been into video games. Yep. Um, but I think this is a whole different beast for you, so oh. I'm wondering what you've learned. Oh, boy. Um, so my first question for you is... Mm-hmm. Since you came into this as a newbie, in that you've come so far six years later, what would you say was your biggest surprise uh, in tabletop gaming? Uh, it's not a cult. I think that well, I, I, in in that uh, in that original episode, uh, I had I had been like, "Oh, is it a cult?" And I kind of knew it wasn't. Um, but hey, satanic panic was a real thing. That was a real thing, and but it it was not on the it was not on the tabletop community that that happened. Um, but not so much that, but that it was um, there there was a, a conception that I had that it was almost impossible to get into the the space of tabletop gaming more than anything because it felt very insular, and I think what I've found from from all my time is that it's anything but it, it's actually trying incredibly hard to pull as many people as it can into it um it is a cult after all <laughs> maybe it is a, no but but the idea that it actually it encourages people to actually uh, join into that it is not so difficult to integrate into you know i would look at mostly like the mechanics end of things I would see so many different layers to it that I had to try and figure out. And it was intimidating in a lot of ways to try and start that process. And through the last six years, I've realized, well, no, actually, it's not intimidating. Um, it's just complex. And complexity, <laughs> once you start to get into it, isn't, isn't nearly as daunting Um, if you can kind of like take it in layers and also realize that it is far more than the mechanics themselves. When I started to actually play in games and all of that, I realized, oh no, there's, you can actually frame this in the way that it is a storytelling device. It's almost a, a mechanism for people to be able to do group storytelling in a way 
it's the same sort of thing that the old oral tradition of storytelling from like the Homeric era tried to accomplish. Um, but instead of one person talking through a, through a storyline to other people, you have a collaborative uh, effort from, from a group to tell something unique and interesting and that this provides a framework for it. Once I could kind of get that wrapped through my head, um, it, it completely changed the way I looked at things. And from hearing stories from people who found that it actually helped them, especially if they have social anxiety, um, if, if, they, if they have trouble interacting with people and how they've been able to benefit from it, um, all the people that found their calling, their, their you know, passion in it, uh, I realized, no, it, it's, not just, it, it's not just an insular thing that tries to exclude people. It's actually the complete opposite of it. I think that's probably the, the biggest surprise that I had from it is that it's, it's actually a modern version of how we tell and create and craft stories. All right, then. That is, that is very concise and very interesting. Complexity isn't always intimidating. Uh, it's definitely important, I think, as well. Yeah, it's um, it. I mean, complexity will can, can make it seem a lot more daunting. Sometimes, if you have a lot of mechanics, it can be it, it can be really in, intimidating, which is why I usually do like mechanics like games or streamlined games. But um, I think if you if you start people off at a uh, at a point where they're able to just see something simple that they can engage with, um, the the deeper mechanics you can you can have creep in there over the course of time, and and it's it's okay because then you've actually introduced people to it. It's gateway mechanics. That's what we're calling. <laughs> Uh, has there been uh, one thing on that note with the mechanics wise has there been a mechanic that you found in any of the games you've played mm. or that we've talked about that you just find way too complex or too intimidating for you to even want to try <laughs> you know uh, it's funny because one of the things that I was considering doing an episode of at one point was uh, I think it was a million little D&D &D things so these these were uh, a few little mechanics from uh, D and D that kind of kind of came along, and I realized that they don't usually come up very often. Like these are mechanics that you don't necessarily see much, like um, cover, surprise, tremor sense, material components. <laughs> material components that most people wave away unless you need like a diamond yeah exactly Ex yeah yeah i i think that the thing is is that sometimes i've just found that there's mechanics that aren't necessarily utilized but if you're not familiar with the fact that they kind of just aren't utilized <laughs> Um, then you, you start thinking, oh, do I have to know about all of this? One time I, I, I was thinking to myself, oh, how am I going to craft the, how am I going to do this spell? Look at the material components I'm going to have to have. Oh no. And, and like, do I have a small piece of carrot? Why do I need a small piece of carrot? And, um, and, and the, uh, the answer really came back is, um, well, one, we, we assume that, you know, you'd pretty much have any of those little things that you'd need and and also um you're you're a monk so <laughs> uh yeah the the key handles all of the you you don't need material components i'm like well that would have been nice to know <laughs> before i sweat that i could do a thing i feel like this happened more or less when i used to watch you do um war gaming when, oh god. When, yeah, when we got when, when when I would see that giant table and I'd see the rulers and stuff come out and I'm like, "Okay. Um <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> this feels this feels a little too complex." So when we started talking about those and uh the like the Lego version that that someone had made and all of those, uh I felt like I'm going to have to kind of nod my head through a lot of this because I get the concept but it just feels far far too complex for me to really want to wrap my head around. Um you know, it it's the same thing actually for me with with video games. I appreciate when they get into more you know deeper mechanics if they can kind of like lead me into it and present it over the course of time, but sometimes when they present a ton of menus up at the front, I just I tune out and I put the game away. 
it's just it's not necessarily that any mechanics are too complex for you to wrap your head around it's that if it's presented all to you at the very beginning i don't know what to do with that like i i can't i can't assume like when i'm talking about the the D D stuff if you presented material components at the same time you presented my stat block i assume both of those are equally important and i had to figure out both of them at the same time you of course wouldn't do that that would be a terrible idea don't don't do that folks <laughs> don't try don't do that don't try to tell explain to them challenge ratings and and how sight and sound work at the same time as you're trying to explain that they have skills it's just a <laughs> it's just a bad idea <laughs> you're going to overwhelm people um because they haven't grasped the very basic mechanics of, of your game um i think that is definitely one thing uh that video games tend to do a lot better at than tabletop games. In most cases, I want to say, uh, video games are able to present you in a here's how to play step by step better and more fluidly than than tabletop. But I think that's more so because you can design a tutorial in a video game that is disguised as gameplay um, without making like bashing you over the head with everything. Right, and that, um, I mean, you could do that kind of in tabletop if the, but really only if the GM is, is able to kind of give that kind of tutorial, and a lot of times, like with new players, you just kind of assume that they'll eventually catch on to it. But the other thing worth considering, Alex, is that in video games, most of the mechanics are hidden. They're, they're in the code. They're, they're, That's also true. They're locked away. In a tabletop game, all your mechanics are laid out in front of you, and it is up right. to the players and to the person running to figure it out and to to work right. with it. You're the. Computer. I think something that would be. Yeah. I th I think something that would be really fun for tabletop role playing games uh, to go and do uh, once in a while would be if you're designing a new system and you're trying to get people into it, uh, designing those like starter scenarios. Mm -hmm. where it pulls you through a segment of different tasks that you have to get through so you see how different mechanics work. Depending on what your theme is, depending what you want to do, it's like, all right, you go through some social, some combat, some skill check sections. So, like, just a, a one-shot campaign where you got to go through all these different sections of it, but nothing too over the top. I think something like that could be really cool to have in like involved in rule books where it's like here's a um free one shot adventure to go with your rule book purges so that you could go yeah here's this one shot you have these pre gen characters you can all play as these people you have all these skills and here's how to use these things um I think that would be great in tabletop to have more of that because it would be way easier on uh, both GMs and players new to the system and new to gaming to be able to sit there and go, oh, this is provided for me to teach me how to get into this. Yeah, it feels like that it would be really good, especially for new players, uh, just to provide something very rudimentary, just a, something that anyone could also run if they were looking to run for the first time. Um, that they could do by the books to just see how the the overall mechanics work. Um, I mean, they do this with a different wizard's property, but if you think of Magic the Gathering, there are starter packs. So you'll get a starter pack, and it will basically be a constructed deck. Uh, so you can actually, at that point, see, oh, how do all of these cards work? Instead of trying to build a freeform, you, you know that they all have that, uh, you know, functionality. When I first started playing Magic, um, way back in the before times, the long, long ago, it was Mercadian Masks era, they actually had a starter kit, which had, like, two decks that used some different lands and were constructed with very basic cards that had very few additional special mechanics. They were mostly vanilla, and there was even a tutorial video that you could watch that explained how like the, the, the whole system worked. And you and somebody else who had never played before would be able to take these two like fairly small, pretty rudimentary decks and play a game pretty easily. And then they would implement new things if you got started. You could just build off of it. That I don't see that as much with RPGs. Yeah. 
So that was all the first question, right? <laughs> that was all the first question, yeah. <laughs> so, so you've learned quite a bit. You've you've learned they're not as hard to get into, and they're more less insular than you thought. Um, what was it like for you, Nathan? Okay. Your first time playing a role playing game, or not even the first, but like <sighs> as you've played them, what it's like for you actually trying to get into your character? Actually. Um, I think that's probably the easier part for me, because at that point, you're just pretending to inhabit a character. Actually, video games train me very well for that. I'm not me, I'm somebody else, and that's just who I'm playing. So doing that was actually uh, not particularly hard, at least for me, getting into doing a character, because I could just kind of come up with, with a character that I wanted to play. However, something that I did have to keep uh, reminding myself of, and I hope people who are starting out into gaming also think about, is you're not the only player. Being able to play your game and have your character is fine, but you are not the only person involved, and it's not always going to be about you. So I did have to get used to... And this, no one really told me this, but I, I just kind of realized this when I, when I started. Is just the idea that there are times where you have to sit back. You can't always be on. You can't always be, you know, the, the, the center. The spotlight's not always going to be on you. Other people also have to be involved for it to work. And you have to be able to allow that. And as a player, you also can't really control the action. There's a person running the game. They they are the primary driver of the narrative and the story. So I think the biggest thing that I really learned about character design is when you're playing, knowing when your character is actually going to have to be in the spotlight and taking that opportunity to actually be in that spotlight taking advantage of what has been built on beforehand and adding what you can into the storyline and to the narrative as it goes forward. I don't know how often that gets described to new players. I, I think especially in your case, I feel like that was definitely something you had to learn. Because mm. um, I know how much you really enjoy being on uh, yeah. when you're when you're doing things. And I, I know from hearing all your stories, like, oh, yeah, this is all the stuff I did. I'm like, cool, but what about the other players? <laughs> what did they do, Nathan? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they did. <laughs> they, they, they were doing something else cool. It was really neat. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> they did. No, they, 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 did, they did cool stuff, and I tried to listen. Um, I'm trying to get better at that, obviously, uh, you know, so that I can keep track of what everybody else is doing. One of the things that I started to do with uh, at least Dr. McFly in, in the uh, 1879 campaign is that while I'm not necessarily on all the time, when I do my journal entries and keep, keep that running journal going, uh, which I'll have to put somewhere so people can follow along, I know there's a few people who like it, is uh, Dr. McFly is usually an oblivious character anyway, doesn't really care all that much about even the other people in his party. <laughs> And so when he starts referring to what they did, he can't remember any of their names. So he has to <laughs> use the, anything that he actually knows about them. So there's uh, one character, a uh, Bentley Boodle, and he's a, he's he's a big game hunter, and he's a, a photographer. He always has his camera with him and some slides. And so, but all. McFly can refer to him as is photo hunter because it's all he really knows does not know that he's a lord doesn't know he came from an aristocracy doesn't really think too much about that I know that you're a hunter and you like photos we have one character who is, is a troll and he is a, a soldier in the army and um, that is all McFly knows about so he is the trollger in his in the journal that's just everything that we know me personally i do try to keep uh, apprised of what people are doing and if there's a chance for me to actually add in something to that dialogue to enhance that story i like to try and do that me uh, you know now i'm kind of in it a little bit but also it it enhances what's happening with the other characters 
I know that a lot of times when people are starting out, uh, you're probably really into like trying to figure out what the mechanics are because that's what's in the book. <laughs> like when they present you with an RPG book, it's going to be all the mechanics itself. But the actual story elements and crafting that and interacting with other people isn't necessarily something that they tell you in the book, but it's also a huge component of role-playing. And once you start to get that down, I think it becomes a lot easier to realize that may maybe you don't even have to focus as much on the mechanics at every single minute. I, th I think if you focus on the mechanics in every single minute, you're not doing a role-playing game as much as you're just... I'm playing a tactics game. <laughs> You're playing a tactics game, yes. yes. This is That's exactly what it is. You're playing XCOM. XCOM Faerunian Edition. Yes, you're playing XCOM. You are not playing D uh, Divinity or a Wasteland <laughs> or a Fallout, you know. Uh, you're focusing completely on the mechanics and not really about the individual character st stories. And if you're not doing both of those in some degree, I don't think you're getting the real full flavor of why people play role-playing games. Cool. So how many dragons have you come across in six years, Nathan? Um, how many dragons have I come across? A surprisingly small number, actually. <laughs> um, like, I, I just, I keep thinking, like, in, in the, the years that you've been doing it, you've probably come across your fair share. I mean, it's still a lot less than you expect when you hear Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. I know. I think that that's something, too. It, when people hear D&D &D and it's Dungeons and Dragons, they're figuring, oh, I go into a dungeon, I fight a dragon. If you're an outsider and that's, that's literally what you hear, that would probably be the takeaway that you have from it. I think, um, I want to say there were two and it was the same campaign. It was uh, the one that we were doing with Dom. It was when I was Rembrandt. It was the Shadow Dragon. I remember that one. The Fell Dragon. Yeah, the Shadow Fell Dragon, which I killed. Well, uh, the party killed it. I helped, but but we we killed and I used one. Uh, I I took one of its wings so that I could make a a sail for my surfboard. Right. Anyway, there was that, and then there was also another dragon that we actually freed from uh what were the uh, orc captivity, and that was a frost dragon. I think there is, is that. Are those the white dragons? The ones that breathe? Yeah, the, and frost or ice or white. Yeah. They breathe ice. It was that. Yeah, then it's it's either silver or white, I, probably. I think it was a white dragon. Um, but anyway, freed that dragon, uh, and the, the dragon then, you know, after we asked a few questions of it, killed its uh, captor by freezing the captor and then eating it. Yeah, that's kind of what dragons do. <laughs> white white dragons are pretty evil, so it's fine. Yeah, uh, but I mean, we felt bad because it was it was uh, caged, but we we did free it, and then it went off into the the hills, the mountains. Afterward, uh, it didn't thank us, and I feel like that was that was kind of rude. But I mean, it also didn't kill you or eat you, so I guess you're even. Yeah, it was a fairly small one. Like it, it could it could fit into like a like a caged wagon. It wasn't a very large one. Um, Shadowfell dragon a little bit bigger, but then again, that is probably besides one shots or anything like that. That's really the only time I play D and D specifically. Uh, I can say, however, that like in 1879, we did encounter a T Rex. There's that. Yeah, I'm glad you you ran away from it. So that's good. It was not going to go well if we tried to fight it. No. Um, yeah. Was it just a single T-Rex? I heard they're pack hunters. This one was just one, but then you have to remember in the lore of 1879, they're not necessarily dinosaurs like we had here, because these are creatures that would have been coming through the rift in space, essentially. So from a different dimension, essentially. But they looked very much like Saurians that we would know. So T-Rex-esque, we'll oh, say. Oh, okay. T-Rex-esque. I mean, in 1879, they might not have known that T-Rexes were pack animals anyway, so it's fine. That's true. That's true. It hasn't stopped me from encountering um, 
let's see, what were those? We had spiders that were that looked like rocks. They were called arachnids, is what we eventually called them. It hasn't stopped me from battling my fair share of skeletons and zombies and giant bugs called ankegs and um there were some cannibal kids at one point. Um yeah, there's there's been a there's been some stuff. But not a lot of dragons. No. Um, well, do you consider a naga to be a dragon? No. No, okay. Because it is serpentine. But it was a skeleton. It was a skeleton. Well, okay. snakes are serpentine too, but they're not dragons, Nathan. Okay, fine. Fine. There there was a Githyanki that I killed, and then I took its swords. That worked out re- well for me. The point is, though, battled a lot of things, but no, they were not in the title of the game. <laughs> So, does and there were things I'm sure you weren't expecting. Sure. Now, in the backstory for Rembrandt, though, the temple that he came from, that kind of informs his whole backstory, the one where he actually trained, was Sunscale Temple, and it was supposed to be set up on a former, an abandoned, uh, golden dragon nest that that uh, that was then discovered by a group of monks that went up into the hills looking for inspiration, and that's kind of why everybody from Sunscale also knows Draconic, because there you go. anything that they found from that dragon's lair, texts, books, equipment, they learned about dragon culture a lot from that. But there were no dragons there when the monks arrived. But the backstory for Rembrandt is dragon-related. Got you. Only really encountered the two. Killed one, freed the other. Two. Understood. So, Nathan. Mm-hmm. Six years. Mm. Too many episodes. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a ton of guests on our show. Yes. And I don't want to ask you who your favorite is. Thank I you. feel like that's a disservice <laughs> To a lot of our guests, <laughs> if I were to ask you who was your favorite, yeah, because honestly, I don't think, I don't think we have necessarily a favorite, and if we do, that's fine. But like, that's not important. Pick your favorite. I want to ask. <laughs> yeah, my fa- I only have one child, so it's so easy he for you. Is my favorite. Um, okay. I I want to know who you thought was our most interesting, and in, in your opinion, who is the most interesting guest on, or the most interesting thing that we've talked to a guest about like something one of our guests or could be more than one if you want sure that was just interesting or you just really were inspired by for instance oh that's also a hard one that's also kind of like yeah your child um <laughs> let's see it doesn't have to be the most inspired but i'm like i, I want to know like someone that was really interesting to you or really inspired you, you know, some way. You know, well, I mean, I, I could obviously, I, I, I would give you a lot of, like, obviously when big people had come on the show and, um, y- you know, the, the Team Phoenixes and the Jason Carls and the Matt Leacocks came on the show, I was mostly just fascinated that they came on the show. Um, <laughs> right. But, but if I were to talk to you about someone who you might not necessarily think about, um, I'm going to I'm just give me one second because I'm just going to go through I, I got to go back in the vault because I remember one person who you weren't actually you weren't there for it it's infinitely better because I was not there yes it is, it is so so much better now this was in 2019 so oh that's not that far ago it was not that long ago but it was it's still in the before times it was still in the before times but anyway uh we're talking about uh delve 218 which was making history and that's actually the name of the the um project that we were talking about but anyway that was tristan zimmerman uh from molten sulfur press he came on to discuss this very interesting project that i I didn't necessarily know that much about but it was called making history three one session rpgs one i kind of like the idea that he had actually built them to be like one session rpgs but what i thought was very interesting about that and that i didn't necessarily think about before is to take a few pieces from history historical things and turn them into an an rpg uh so what those were were actually um traveling across a frozen landscape in greenland uh during the norse 
uh, the the days of, of like Norse uh, exploration uh, in what was called Norse Ivory. The one that I thought was incredibly interesting, actually, which was going to uh, a Native American city uh, called Cahokia, which uh, he explained a lot about. I think I just mostly learned about history on that episode, and that was just interesting. <laughs> Because he was explaining about how, uh, uh, like, Cahokia was actually, like, a like a literal city with earthen, like, ziggurats, but it was here in, like, near what present-day St. Louis is. And I was like, oh, didn't even know that was there. So <laughs> fun. <laughs> and then taking it to, like, a submarine in more modern day, because he actually came from uh, the military, so he was familiar with, with ships. And was able to explain a little bit more about like what what a modern uh, submarine. If the lights went out and y you you were you were in like a red light situation and you could not find anybody else, that that would be kind of scary because now it feels like you're on practically like a metal death coffin. Um, but uh, but uh, and that was a darkened ship. So through like those three. I think what I found really impressive was how much you could learn about history through RPGs if that was what your intent was. Uh, and that, that one I found just really, that stuck with me, I think, more than a lot of, uh, a lot of interviews did when we were talking about um, Kickstarters, especially. So, uh, yeah. But uh, obviously, beside that, any of the big names that we've had on, I was just surprised that they came on. And we've said that at least a few times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I wasn't sure what you were gonna pick. I was just curious. Sure. Ah, uh, sure. There's, there are like I'm going through right now, looking at like just our our collection of shows, mm -hmm. and it's like, all right, we had some of these people, and <laughs> yeah, we sure did. <laughs> um, yeah, it it's uh, it is too too many to name. Uh, really, like uh, we we uh, obviously Rudy Rutenberg and. Ryan Chapels uh, and um, Jeff Tidball. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that was uh, one I wanted to have on. Obviously, yeah. who's is bigger name too. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then even in the smaller like indie uh, space of things, I feel like we've had some of the bigger names in that area too. Like we've had Patrick Leader on. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, absolutely, we have. And obviously, Root and and, and Vass have done very well. Um, we've even, I believe we had Chris Bissett on too, and he does pretty good too. We've had Chris on a few times at this point. Um, we had, uh, you, you also were not here for this one. Um, but we had James D'Amato on, uh, from, from, uh, one, one shot podcast who's has, ah, yes. has a whole network, but he came on to explain how I can make my ultimate unicorn backstory. I was happy that he could do that. <laughs> I, I, I now know how I can build that. So that's that's fun. I learned something. You know, I I am hoping with the new show, yeah, that our guests are going to vary from just uh, people making games, mm -hmm. which is mostly what they have been for the last six years yes. of anyone we've had on Dell, sure. and just more people in, engrossed in the gaming space. Sure, yeah, uh, and just uh, like I would love to have more people that have their own podcasts on. Yep, um, just talk about gaming. Talk about games, making games, playing games, and like some of the other content that we don't do is not even game related. But like, hey, you're in the gaming space, but tell me something that's not a game that you absolutely love doing. Yeah, tell me something I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. like you tell everyone this stuff all the time. Like I know with Chris Bissett, for instance, mm -hmm. um, lots of game stuff, but he also does music. He's a musician. Oh, yes, he is. Like. If you want, if we want to get Chris on, if he's listening, Chris, we'd love to have you come on and talk to us <laughs> about music. What's it like being a rock star while you're at it? Um, I know uh, one of my friends, I want to uh, see if he'll come on the show. He's a, a Twitch streamer, mm. um, but he's also a DJ. Oh, like, yeah. He does music stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I want to get him on and be like, so I know you do all this stuff on Twitch, but I know from knowing you personally that you're also a DJ, but like... There's a whole ton of stuff that you're into. Like, we can deep dive about music. We can talk about games. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all, whatever. I just love that. It, with ending this show, I love the opportunities we're going to have moving forward. Oh, sure. To talk about more stuff broadly. Mm. I know a lot of the things I've listened to in preparation 
for TPK, mm-hmm. uh, personally, have been like, yeah, if you're doing a podcast, what you want to do is really niche down. Yeah, yeah. And I agree with that to a point. Like, it's definitely a lot easier to get into that niche sure. of just saying, like, just a D&D podcast. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. But then it's... I, I feel like that's limiting then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where we can have a broader show about gaming as long as we're enjoying the content we make. Oh, sure. Hopefully other people will enjoy it as well and get something new out of it that's not just the same, oh, you're going to listen to the 1300th episode about D&D. Yeah, yeah. Which, again, not knocking people that do that, that's fine. No. That content is sometimes great. I mean, let's face it, D&D is the 800-pound gorilla of tabletop gaming. You're probably going to talk about it if you're talking about gaming. <laughs> it's yeah. going to happen. And I know, like, um, back in the day, Stories of the, Fifth, uh, of the Fifth Age, for instance, which is oh, a yeah. D&D backstory, mm-hmm. uh, for that, that was like, there's no more backstories to really go into without going into homebrew in the extended universe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like, all right. Well, it's just, I, I like the opportunity that we're going to have to talk to other people, oh, yeah. especially between tabletop and video games. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, really, really gaming as a general concept, because I know that even outside of, like, tabletop and uh, uh, d- digital, um, like, you you get very interested in things like uh, like the, the ARPG kind of stuff, um, and... There's there's a lot of different realms of things that you may consider to be gaming in some way uh, that we just didn't talk about or didn't even entertain really on Delve. And I yeah. think that being able to, you know, do that a little bit more is just more interesting. Um, there's, there's so much in the scope of it. And we, um, if you look at the trajectory of Delve... Um, you know, we, we started out very niche, but we really, we, we, we did expand and the scope of what we were talking about over the last six years because we stopped having a lot that we could talk about directly about that, about that very niche subject. Um, as much as I do love talking game mechanics and game design, and I will... I will gladly talk to designers all day. It's just so interesting, especially, like, talking about different projects. That is still fun. Mm-hmm. But, like, there's so much more, too. Oh, yeah. There certainly is. Um, you can you can look at so many different realms of gaming and what that means. Um, there's, there's so many people, too, that as I start to build up, essentially, the new wish list... For people to be on the show, I know I know of people that are, you know, psychologists who are in gaming and see it as actually very therapeutic for a lot of people who uh, do have, like, like I was mentioning earlier, social anxiety and stuff like that. There are game historians that will be able to tell you about games that have been lost to the ages that were around thousands of years ago that we're only now really uh, aware of that got uncovered almost as archaeology. And there's so many great things, but they're not necessarily specifically mechanics-related, but incredibly interesting and very much worth discussing more in detail. Yeah. Mm. I think it'll be really interesting and really fun, and boy, that <laughs> that wish list is just going to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, my wish list has always been pretty ambitious, and uh, <laughs> I'll probably keep a lot of those ambitious ones on there. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, we're we're gonna expand that <laughs> a little bit more, and and some of them might actually come on the show. You know, <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, but uh, yeah, I forgot what the question was that I was originally answering. Oh, I was asking you who your most interesting person oh. you thought was on, that we had on the show. Yeah, yeah, um, me. Definitely not. <laughs> it was definitely Bing Crosby. It was definitely Bing Crosby. Unfortunately, he will not be back on. <laughs> <sighs> For shame. We all or... know why. 
for shame. No, we don't. Nothing happens ever. Oh, he knows. I want to ask you one more thing, Nathan. Okay. Have you learned anything <laughs> at all in the last 300 episodes of this podcast? Have I learned anything? <laughs> Anything. anything. Have you learned anything at all? Doing this podcast, talking to game designers, interviewing them, talking about mechanics, design, aside from just learning how to play like a couple RPGs, mm -hmm. have you really learned anything? Or has this just kind of been fun? <laughs> well, I mean, you can do both. You could learn. No, you can't, Nathan. You, you need to let me. <laughs> you could learn and you can have fun too. Um, no, no, it, it definitely wasn't fun, so what I say is, um, It wasn't fun, that's why we're ending. <laughs> it definitely wasn't fun, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, half kidding. Uh, but I learned, I learned how much time it takes to put episodes together. <laughs> no. Um, I think... Aside from audio editing, what have you learned? Specifically about the gaming part, huh? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta be in that realm. Um, I uh, learned that, be that different from the concept that people might have had about, um, here, you'll raise up a level in, like, uh, if, if you just do, like, 30 or 40 hours with this character... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a few people sitting around like every single week and just grinding through to to do that. It is not really so much about that aspect. It's really not about I need to gain these levels so that I'm more powerful. Because if you came from a video game background, that is a very primary motivator. Uh, I, I want to be level 2, 3, 4, 5 now, and I'm going to get new skills. That's in there, in a lot of them at least. Uh, to some degree, it's in every RPG. But, um, but it's not the primary reason why you would want to play. The, the stories that you end up telling, uh, the people that you get to interact with, the... Um, the ability to actually build a story in more of a freeform way, not having those predetermined choice, cause and effect sort of things, but have, have a lot more abstractness in the story that you're telling. And to be able to get into territory that is definitely more personal and customizable is the, is the reason why people keep coming back to it over and over again. It's not necessarily true of everyone, that plays, I'm sure there are some that actually like very regimented rules and guidelines. I probably won't play with you any time. We're probably in different groups. But a lot of people have found, especially as role-playing games have taken more of a mainstream uh, position, especially with streaming, um, that people have started to realize that, that that aspect of it is so much richer and more interesting than just the, I got more powerful now and my sword glows so I, I can defeat all the monsters. Uh, I think that's probably what I learned, is that the, the reason why you'd want to play a tabletop game is very different than the reason you'd want to play a video game. They're different animals altogether. They might seem like they're related, and there is some crossover... But the mental state that you're in and the way you approach them, completely different. Well, if you want to play tabletop games with the social aspect mm. intact, yeah, they're different. They're definitely different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you think about it, though, Alex, even in terms of if you were just mechanics heavy on those, like we were saying earlier in the episode, the mechanics in the tabletop version, are all laid out in front of you, and they need to be interpreted and used by the players themselves. And in a video game, they are all hidden in code behind the graphics and music. You know, it is still a different animal in a lot of ways, and how you interact with the game is going to be very different from one to the other. Now I want to see someone in tabletop try to glitch out the, the mechanics. <laughs> you know... 
I th- <laughs> I think yeah, I need the spiffing Brit to go to tabletop gaming and explain that like no D and D is perfectly balanced with absolutely no exploits. Obviously he's on our wish list to come on the show then. He'll come on and he will explain in detail exactly what the glitches are. Uh, we'll just offer him some tea. We will offer him some Yorkshire gold. I can go grab that soon. And, uh, yeah, he can come on and, uh, and explain that more in detail. I would be so very, very happy if that happened. <laughs> I think there's one central problem with the exploitation of the tabletop game. is that since you always have somebody running it, the person running it can determine if you get to use that exploit or not. There's the one problem. In a video game, there is no tech. The actual game mechanics are built into the system, and there really isn't anybody looking over that saying, hmm, no, you can't, not until they patch it. So you can exploit the code to as much degree as you want and the mechanics that are in there. With a tabletop game, though, partially because of how freeform it is, but because you have someone central running it, they could say, oh, no, you can't because a uh, magic spell. Just <laughs> just throw something out. I can't because magic. Can't because magic. That's a slogan. Yep, I can't because magic. Or even better slogan, I can because magic. These are going to be new merch on the merch store. That's right. For TPK. I can't because magic. Because magic. Exactly. We'll get we'll get Craveyard <laughs> right on that. Crave's going to be on it. It's going to be great. Well, uh, there was a one point that I floated the idea of... I thought that this was interesting. Maybe we'll talk about this on the, the new show. But the idea that you could have characters that you develop that could have signature spells that you actually develop yourself um, as sort of like, you know, a, a narrative device. And um, I, I thought that there it would be really funny if you had one... That was just a character that call, was called Iken has fireballs, and uh, and and they just they had like a really powerful fireball spell that was like a conflagration spell, and that was just what they did. But I kind of imagine that the character portrait for Iken has was uh, him just hanging on a tree limb like that cat uh, from the posters. Oh yeah, <laughs> and a, and a and a fireball lighting that tree on fire <laughs> while he's on the branch. <laughs> I just thought that was funny. It's like, yeah, you could have signature spells. You could consider, like, you know, what would happen if I, uh, you know, tried to use that as an exploit. But again, you have a GM that could say, uh, no, you, you, you're, you're not going to be able to do quite that much. I understand that Rembrandt glows, Nathan, but that doesn't mean that he, like, illuminates dark spaces without a torch. <laughs> He it, he has a soft glow. It's 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 visible for like five ten feet. Let's say. I feel like this is a conversation that happened. This might have been at some point a clarification that a party a certain party had to make <laughs> on how much Rembrandt glowed <laughs> because for 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 practical and reasonable purposes would I, like i can i can illuminate spaces around me pretty easy but um most people are going to need a torch if they're in my vicinity and also it's going to be kind of hard for me to be stealthy if i also glow i think that that was also one of the things just on a side note is is like how am i going to be able to do like shadow walking and stuff if i'm glowing well it depends if you appear there first or if the light does ah fair but like he he illuminates himself he's it, it i i always kind of imagine like rembrandt sort of like has a bioluminescence thing going on for him so, yeah he's algae he's algae exactly <laughs> he's algae <laughs> Uh, no, of course you can roll for this if you um, if you have a negative one in the skill, but but you rolled a one, so technically you got a zero. So um, yeah, you try to eat the sprites, thinking that they're mushrooms. That does sounds not, about right. That does not go over well with the sprites, by the way. 
I would say that if I learned anything, it, it was it was mostly that. But yes, it's not <laughs> so hard to get into gaming if you really want, and it does have to be something that you actually want. You can lead a horse to a 20-sided die, but you can't make him roll. Uh, but once you do, uh, you'll, you'll find that it's not nearly as complicated as people might want to make it out to be. It, it's, it's, it's a threshold that you can indeed get over. When I try to explain to people now who don't really understand it at all, uh, the the immediate thing that comes to mind is that they see like the they see the polyhedral dice and they go it's too complicated <laughs> <laughs> like like that seems to be the immediate thing you see the polyhedral dice oh these are all dice that you use ah what do I do now um, once you actually assign them to something explain what they do it's a it's a lot easier like once you actually start playing. So I guess that that's what I would say is once you actually start playing, it becomes a lot easier to understand what's going on. <laughs> give give it a go. You should try. And if you need to know more about it, you can listen to our new show. <laughs> I thought you were going to say listen to the last 300 episodes of Tell. You can listen to the last 300 episodes and then to the new show when it launches. So to answer your question, though, in a serious fashion, Alex... Um, no, I really haven't learned anything. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I really haven't learned anything. And it would be, it would be disingenuous of me to say that somehow I know everything now. But, uh, I'm never going to know that. But yeah. Nathan does know everything. Nathan does know, uh, how to spell everything. Uh, exactly. I, You've already Z, spelled. damn. Well... It was worth a try. Never, never assume that you know everything. Maybe that's what I learned: is that you'll never learn everything, and you'll never, you never be a true like expert in things. I keep thinking about this. I'm gonna digress a minute again, but there was um, a really interesting documentary once that was called uh, "Jiro Dreams of Sushi," and I don't know how you feel about sushi. I am pro sushi. I, I do enjoy sushi. Okay, good. Well, there is a uh, an, an old man in uh, Shibuya Station in Japan, and his name is Jiro Ono, and he's a world-famous uh, sushi chef. He has been working every day, like literally every single day of his life since he was 15 years old, making sushi. And they made this documentary when he was like in his 70s, 80s, um, and they kind of asked him at a certain point, uh, considering that you have this world famous restaurant in Shibuya station and people are scheduled out three months and it's like $600 a setting, uh, for, for a, uh, set menu. How does it feel to be a master, a master in the craft of making sushi? And what he basically said was, you're never going to master this. Every day I learn something. Every day I expand my understanding. I will never be a master. You can't master this. You don't master this as a craft. And I kept thinking that in almost any kind of realm, that's not a bad way to look at things, that you're never going to truly master something. I'm never going to master how gaming works. I'm never going to be like that. I don't think anyone really, uh, you know, tries to be a master gamer, so to speak. Well, people that play chess. People who play chess, <laughs> yes. But, like, even when I, I, I was watching, like, Queen's Gambit, it's one of those things where even master chess players realize that at some point, someone's probably going to beat you, even if you're the greatest in the world. You know, it's never going to be you. You And even if you win every single game, you learn from every single game how to be better than you were before. So the continuous learning experience is actually something I look forward to. And uh, and so I think that's probably the thing that I really learned. Maybe that's what I actually learned throughout this whole process is that I actually appreciate the, the process of learning more every time we do this. Oh, good. Because yeah. we're going to do more of it. Yes, we're, we're going to do more of it. 
um, there's there's going to be the death and rebirth, the the death of the the delve death, and the the pebble rebirth. <laughs> I think that's how that works. The knockdown um, and the getting back up again. Uh, I didn't get Chumbawamba do a song about that. Chumbawamba did. We need Chumbawamba to come on the show. Hey, maybe Chumbawamba could uh, do our um, can do our theme music. Maybe if we ask them real nicely, we still need we still need music. We are currently taking theme song, and by theme song, I mean opening and closing show sound suggestions. <laughs> we we are we need something that goes between segments and stuff that starts at the beginning and ends the episode. We need a we need a a total pebble knockdown, uh, music track. Uh, we we we've been so happy to have Matt Soul's flair uh, on the show for the last three hundred episodes, um, but uh, but it, it's time to get something new. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, on that note, so so that was I think that was your five questions. Yeah, I think that was five questions. That was very five good. questions. Five whole questions. Okay, good. Well, in that case, I have one question that I keep asking you every episode. And that is... Where's Alex? the beef? Um, that's yes. That, that's, a, that's a whole other thing. There's an old lady who would be very happy that you said that. Oh. Um, <laughs> from the 80s. Uh, so uh, she's probably not... She's probably dead now. The point is, the question I had for you was, Alex, if anyone wanted to find more information about the show or the content that we make, where could they go? You can go to TotalPebbleKnockdown.com. <laughs> Actually, that's for yeah. the new show, uh, which we did just put live. There's still some work being done on it, but go ahead, check out the site. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got all our social links on it, so join our new Discord and all that stuff. But... If you would like to find out all the stuff we have on the Delve, you can go to delvecast.com. That's correct. And delvecast.com should still be in the form that you know it for the majority of the year, actually. Uh, so if you have wanted to catch up on stuff, feel free. It's a good opportunity to do so. Uh, and also make sure to check out our Patreon. Our Patreon will remain uh, through the new show, but any of that additional content of the bonus stuff that we put on there, that's all still going to be there. Uh, so there's never a bad time to join us. Uh, our tier list will be a little bit different, and also we're going to have um, some additional uh, bonus stuff for people who, who join us there, so make sure to keep apprised of what we're doing over there. Like discounts on merchandise. Also, Ooh. merchandise. <laughs> yes, also, merchandise and discounts therein, so something worth thinking about. Uh, you can also find us on all of those social things. I am actually at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and our show is currently still at Delve Podcast. It currently is. That's also going to be changing over soon. But if you follow us there, you're going to be already followed for the new thing. So, you might yeah, well unless things don't go smoothly. Then we'll let you know. Oh, but no. Don't you know that every plan goes completely smoothly? That's how things work. Oh, right. Everything's fine. Don't click off. Everything is situation normal, folks. There are no issues. Uh, but I think that's actually all, all, all the issues that we had for this particular episode. We are in... This is the pen ultimate episode. The ultimate death. pen episode, huh? The ultimate pen. The next one is the teller episode, and then we we'll be done. So it's silence. <laughs> it's all silence. It's just going to be an entirely silent episode. That would be terrible. Maybe we'll do that as a uh, the the after the last episode, which by default then makes it the last episode. Oh, wouldn't that be interesting if we did like uh one that was terrible at the end to kind of like bookend it with the terrible first episode. <laughs> Uh, let's not do that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we, this is the second to last episode because we have, or first to last episode? Yeah. It's whatever. It's the one that comes before the last episode. Cut this like an hour ago. We will be back one more time 
Thank you for joining us. We will see you on the next episode. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. So I kind of wanted to flip this table on you and kind of go, Nathan. Yeah. After 300 episodes on the show. Mm-hmm. Can you hear those motorcycles? After 300 years, can I hear those motorcycles? Um, yeah, can you hear the Okay, sorry. Yeah, always. <laughs> I always hear the. <laughs> no, I meant the ones driving by. Oh, um... No, I, I, think, I think we're good. I can't hear Okay, them. sorry. Yeah.